the opportunities that we think um, uh, are available to us, talk a little bit about the idea of the BQX and where we think it can go and what we think it can do, and then um, go back and have a table conversation with many of you. And just so you guys all know, um, facilitators at each table, could you raise your hand? Okay, note takers at each table, could you raise your hand? All right. The facilitators and note takers will guide you through a conversation um, and also make sure to be writing down all of your comments. So we do um, absolutely mean it when we say we want to hear your thoughts, we're going to take them back, we're going to incorporate them into everything that we do. Um, and please feel free uh, to be open and, and uh, discuss as many different things as you can. Um, so the challenges, uh, as um, Maria mentioned, about uh, 400,000 people live and 300,000 people work along the corridor. This is a dense, dense urban area and it is growing very quickly. I think over the last few years on the Brooklyn side, the Brooklyn waterfront has grown at about four times the rest of the borough. On the Queens side, um, development and growth has happened at about 20 times the rest of the borough in Queens. Um, there's poor transit access. And some of you here in the story know many, many residents live more than a half mile from a, uh, from a subway. That's true in Astoria. That's also true in neighborhoods farther south, like Red Hook and Sunset Park, for example. There's also missing links. While there's a lot of, of good east-west transportation, there's not a lot of north-south transportation. The way they built out the subway system originally was to connect people into the downtown core. It was a hub and spoke model. But what we see now is with the growth that has been along the corridor, there's no good north-south um, connections to connect people to things like job hubs, parks, academic institutions, and other cultural institutions along the route. So we think that there's a, a, an opportunity, and lots of opportunities here, whether it's tackling transit equity. Um, oh, we lost one. Don't hit that button. Um, uh, well, it's home to over 400,000 people. Almost 40,000 or 10 percent of them are in are, are residents of natural developments up and down the corridor, including several of the largest in New York City: Queensbridge, Ravenswood, Astoria Houses, also Red Hook um, uh, down in Brooklyn. There is an opportunity for transit-oriented development. A lot of the the development along the corridor, and one of the criticisms that is sometimes levied, is that. The development that happens is not met with new transportation needs, and people move in, but there's no new ways to move them, which is why you see um, overcrowding in a lot of our transit system. So meeting the new development with a real piece of transit infrastructure, we think is a real opportunity. Connections to job hubs. As I mentioned before, um, a, a changing dynamic, and one of the things that is coming with some of the growth that we see along the corridor, are emerging job hubs, whether they be in Long Island City, as Costa mentioned, Cornell Tech. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is an emerging hub that, pay, that has lots of good jobs um, in a variety of different sectors. And even as far down as Sunset Park and some of the industrial assets um, down there is a, is a, growing, uh, a growing job hub. And increases um, for transportation alternatives and connections along the route. Whether it be the 10 ferry stops, the 30 different bus routes, 15 different subway lines, and 100 plus uh, city bike stations, there's a tremendous opportunity to take people who are in these comparative transit deserts and connect them to more means of transportation opportunity to connect to um, uh, other centers in New York City. So what's the idea? The idea is a modern, efficient, state-of-the-art transit link to support these growing neighborhoods along the waterfront. As the mayor said in his State of the City, uh, the BQX has the potential to change the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. And we think we can improve connectivity with efficient, reliable transit. We can enhance economic development and um, uh, uh, connect people to opportunities up along the corridor in a real way, minimize impacts on traffic, parking, and utilities, and other important considerations, provide a sustainable solution that strengthens our, our streets and strengthens the built environment, all the while remaining uh, and, and having a project that is financially feasible. It also um, aligns with a lot of critical policy goals, whether it's making streets safer and aligning it with Vision Zero. Um, we imagine 45 to 50,000 people could ride the BQX 
each day, over 15 million people annually over the full build out. And with a safe, reliable piece of infrastructure that works with communities as we build out and incorporate into the neighborhood, we think it can make streets safer, pedestrians, drivers, and riders of the BQX. It also has the um, ability to reduce greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050, which is a critical goal of the administration, by investing in green infrastructure with quiet, emission-free operations. And as I mentioned before, um, an increase in access to jobs, one of a, uh, an important uh, priority in the One NYC plan is um, decreasing people's commute times and giving more opportunities for jobs within 45 minutes of where people live. If we can reduce the amount of time people take to travel to work, we can really move the needle for, for families. That also will generate over $25 billion in economic impact in those 30 years and approximately 28,000 construction jobs alone um, over the course of the build -out. So um, we will, I should have mentioned this at the top, I know this is a little tricky to read, we'll throw it up on the website so that everyone can see it and read it, but we wanted to go through the timeline, where we are and what you can expect from us over the course of the next um, uh, few months and years. Uh, as I, the mayor announced um, uh, in BQX in, 20, uh, in the state of the city this year, we are here doing our first round of visioning sessions. We're gonna be up and down the corridor uh, in neighborhoods having meetings just like this over the course of the next two months. We're also doing a detailed analysis that will look at a lot of different components and facets of this plan. In the fall, we're going to come back to you and other neighborhoods uh, uh, up and down the corridor with the results of that detailed plan with what we've incorporated and learned from you guys have uh, a, a first report, a preliminary report, and then begin to uh, uh, build out the BQX after that. Uh, moving down the line, we imagine breaking ground in 2019 and the potential for the first swipe, phone tap, wrist chip, eye scan, whatever the new version of a Metro card is, um, to start in 2024. We get a lot of questions about this and, and I think it's important to call out. Um, at a very early estimate, we think that this could cost around two and a half billion dollars. We're looking at lots of different ways to fund this, but think that we may explore a project that's, uh, or uh, a funding source called the value capture system where we would um, uh, capture value added by the building of the streetcar, which is, important because it means we don't have to take um, funding from other uh, critical transportation priorities. And just on, on operations and maintenance, we think that it would cost very, very roughly around $30 million uh, a year to run. I also, last couple slides here before we get into the table conversations, but wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that we're not the first city to be con uh, contemplating a streetcar. There are lots of other urban areas that have looked at this. Um, in Portland, for example, they have a streetcar. That streetcar runs in the street. It shares traffic. Um, it obeys traffic signals. It has comparatively minor um, uh, 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 stations. Um, they are also, and we'll, we'll get to a little bit on the next slide, they have thought very hard about what it means to have transit-oriented development and meet new development with um, uh, uh, with real transit to move people from residential areas to places of work. Um, in Norfolk, Virginia, there's a street light rail. You know, that's interesting. It operates in a dedicated right of way, which is something that we really want to look at and consider here. Um, their stations blend into the streetscape. Um, they have sometimes single or multiple vehicles, which is an interesting thing for us to think about and learn from because we think streetcars like this or systems like this have the capacity, unlike some other forms of transportation, to meet the density of this corridor. And some other things that we're gonna look at, um, the uh, European tram in London, which operates in a street right of way, typically a de uh, dedicated lane. It too, their stations blend in with the streetscape um, and it interacts with, uh, with traffic and intersections, which is an important thing for us to learn from. And then in Charlotte, North Carolina, they have a light rail, which is a little bit heavier from the infrastructure perspective than we're looking at right now, but worth noting that there are lots of different types of systems that are 
um, around the country and around the world. And just to call out a couple more systems, I mentioned Portland. Um, they also looked at a value capture mechanism to fund part of theirs, which we think is interesting. In Strasbourg, France, they have a really, really big system. And we're calling them out for a couple of reasons. One, they have significant off-wire operations. So a lot of people remember streetcars or trolleys that have the catenary wires and the wires overhead. Battery technology is advancing so quickly that in places like Strasbourg, they have significant off-wire operations um, which allow it to run without the catenary um, uh, system. They've also been a leader in what it means to transform their city streets to accommodate streetcars. You know, we, we, we've heard a lot really this early about questions that people have about what it means to integrate a streetcar into an urban area. Well, lots of cities, including um, cities in Europe, have integrated streetcars into really dense, really narrow, very old streets. And it, it goes to show that there are a lot of ways that you can do this, and a lot of people that have done this before, all of whom we hope to learn from. And then Toronto, we, we like to, to throw the Toronto example up there because it snows in Toronto. There are a lot of little challenges around maintenance and operations that people don't always consider when they're looking at a streetcar. And they have understood how to clear snow, how to operate trains in very cold weather. All of it's to say there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of examples of cities and urban areas that have overcome those challenges. So um, imagine a complete system and a complete BQX system. It would be um, about 30 stops, half mile apart, um, a reliable schedule that would run every five or 10 minutes during rush hour, um, as much exclusive lane and right of way as possible so that it can get significant speeds to be a competitive mode of transportation. Um, we would peg the cost to a metro car so that again, we could work with our colleagues um, at the MTA to make sure a tap or swipe or brain chip um, can work with the system. As I mentioned before, modern streetcars can carry twice as many passengers as buses, which we think is an important component when, when considering the density of this area. And again, we would, we would imagine a system that would maximize connectivity to subways, ferries, and buses. Last two slides, I think. Just a few uh, advantages of a streetcar that are worth calling out. Um, the dedicated right-of-way and signal priority can improve speed, which moves people up and down the corridor in a, in a faster, more efficient way. Level boarding would uh, enable quick access and easy access. They are a comparatively smooth um, and comfortable ride. And their flexible vehicle design supports larger capacity, smaller capacity, um, depending on the needs of the corridor. And we also think it could be good for the neighborhoods along the route. Quiet, emissions-free, opportunities to reimagine what a streetscape looks like, and improve an ability to catalyze economic growth. So what are we going to be doing over the next few weeks and months from a, from a um, detailed analysis perspective? There's a lot of different components and parts of this that we're gonna take a look at. I will go through these very quickly, but, but know that we're taking a pretty wide look at this. Potential routes, types of vehicles, types of power source. We're gonna take an honest look about different modes of transportation, whether the streetcar is the most efficient. Resiliency, phasing, underground infrastructure is, is an important component to this. Um, uh, bridge crossings, along this corridor you have to traverse two waterways, Newtown Creek and the Gowanus Canal down in Brooklyn. We're gonna take a very hard look at different options about going over those waterways. Maintenance and support facilities, where the, the cars sleep at night. Um, the funding mechanism and then all of the, the operations components that, that I alluded to before. Just some to name a few, street cleaning, garbage collection, snow removal, deliveries, emergency response, truck routes, construction, all things that we need to learn more about and understand better um, as we go and think about what it means to introduce a streetcar. So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys at your tables. Um, we'll, we'll lead two different table conversations and hopefully if time allows, do a, um, a, a, a quick collection of ideas at the end. We're gonna talk about a few things. Um, transportation usage, how people use transportation in their neighborhood now, and then have a conversation about streetscape and what the streets around your neighborhood uh, look like. We'll do a quick report out, and I think the good council member Costa Constantinides will close us out 
Um, we'll be here and around the boards afterwards um, uh, to, to answer any questions you have. And on that, I will turn it over to your tables. Thank you very much, and appreciate you all coming out.